Go big Ed. Brokeford 037 and 126 were going to land here. Now I'm told that 126 didn't land. 126 is still there. Now I'm told that he is back in Bovisham. When you get through the Bovisham, can you find out what's happening now? Because I, I thought they were going to swap out a tub. A modern fighter aircraft on full power can cross West Germany in eight minutes. Even in peacetime, it's a full-time job making sure the planes don't run into each other and that they all get home to the right base. We've got the best airplane, and the airplane uh, will do the job. We've got to make sure then that the pilots and the ground crews and everybody that supports that, the command and control system, can get us out there and get us to the target and uh, keep us from getting shot down by our own airplanes or our own ground system. That's uh, one of the very complicated things uh, that is, uh, has gotten a lot of attention. We're confident it, it can work, but it, it takes a lot of coordination. The combat environment is becoming so complex and lethal that there's a real possibility of running out of your most important weapons quite quickly. This A-10, for example, is designed to destroy Russian tanks, which is a rather dangerous occupation. But the men who fly the planes habitually look on the bright side. That's exactly right. And this, this airplane was designed to take it and survive. I mean, there is going to be an awful lot of flack over a battlefield yeah. these days. There is. There's going to be a lot of AAA and a lot of SAMs. AAA? Anti-aircraft artillery. Uh -huh. But you reckon that you can... I mean, you're going low and slow over whole... Armored yeah. divisions and things, and you reckon with those things you've got a decent chance of getting out? Yeah, yeah. sure do. We're going to take losses, sure, but every airplane is. Um, it's you know, something you've got to live with, but uh, there's enough redundancy in the airplane that even if we take a hit, the pilot can probably get out. And I've, everybody's got total confidence. It's got one of the best ejection seats around. Yeah, but the pilot gets out and the plane goes down, but I'm talking about running out of planes, really. Well, I don't know. I'm not one of the big planners. I just fly them. Yeah. An American aircraft manufacturer recently remarked that the next time it will be a come-as-you-are war. The weapons that have already been built on the first day of the war will be the only ones you have. When they've been destroyed, that's it. Uh, the production lines for today's kinds of weapons couldn't possibly be expanded fast enough to replace even a fraction of the losses. All our expectations about a modern conventional war assume that aircraft like this and tanks and guns and electronic equipment of a similar level of sophistication will be around in large numbers. It's a safe enough assumption for the first week of a European war, but by the third week there might not be many of these weapons left, and nobody knows what would happen then. One thing that is likely to happen is that chemical weapons will be used. You can't see them or smell them, but breathe a little or get a microscopic droplet on your skin and you die. And you do not know you're dying until it's too late to do anything about it. The symptoms at first are quite innocent, but headaches are followed by convulsions, involuntary defecation, floods of mucus that almost drown you, and finally, paralysis. Your chest muscles simply stop working and you suffocate. There are many reasons why you get a more horrified reaction to the idea of constructing chemical weapons. I think in some senses it goes back to the Middle Ages and the feeling that chemicals are witchcraft. Um, there's something you can't see, there's something that will kill people without you knowing what is happening. Uh, it's that sort of a magic that I think creates very much of the horror. The Warsaw Pact and NATO both deny any intention of using chemical weapons, except if the other side uses them first. But the other side might just do that, so they both hold regular exercises where their soldiers scramble into the cumbersome gear that would give them at least some protection. And both sides keep huge stockpiles of nerve gas just in case. 
Well, chemicals are considered by the Soviets to be almost a normal part of a conventional war. Not quite, but they are viewed as an inter intermediate sort of weapon. As a matter of fact, one of the Soviet doctrinal statements on this goes back to their quoting of a Harold Brown 1963 document where he referred to chemicals as an intermediate weapon between conventional and nuclear. Wearing protective suits makes everything the troops do much harder. In fact, simply communicating while wearing this gear is so difficult that in chemical exercises, commanders have been known to throw stones at their men to get their attention. Physically, it has its drawbacks. If you are isolated, you're inside very constrictive, restrictive clothing, and you have a difficult time drinking. In virtually impossible unless you can get out of the area to eat. There are other problems that will go with it that go without saying. It's just not, not a simple process. But then, you know, what you're dealing with is a question of survival. If the soldiers get their suits on and survive, the major job becomes decontamination. Vehicles that have been contaminated by droplets of gas are untouchable until they've been washed off, and nobody knows where the vast amounts of water would come from in a combat zone. One NATO plan talked of using West German civilian car washes. Presumably, tank commanders will be issued with five mark coins, at least those of them left alive. As for the suits, you can't take them off until they've been washed down thoroughly with more water, and then you take them off very carefully. It's all a hopelessly domestic response to what will be anything but a domestic situation. Uh, the chemical casualties themselves, if they weren't treated immediately, would not reach us at all. So that someone will have to have dealt with them before they, yes. they get to we, we, we carry with our respirators, we, we, we carry oxine tablets, which are a, a prophylaxis against uh, chemical attack, especially the nerve gas. And we carry atropine, which is an immediate treatment. After uh, you've been exposed. After you've been exposed. But the trick is not to get exposed in the first place. It's rather yeah. difficult sometimes. It's rather difficult sometimes, yes. But at least the soldiers have suits and oxine and atropin. The civilians living downwind from the battlefield don't, and clouds of nerve gas will drift silently and invisibly on the wind for up to a hundred miles, bringing mass death to their towns and villages. The battlefield use of chemical weapons in Europe would inevitably mean civilian casualties in the millions. And we're still talking about what former U.S. Defense Secretary Harold Brown and the Russians have described as an intermediate weapon. What about the real thing? What about nuclear weapons? Since we suspect that conventional war won't work, we also prepare for the nuclear war. First in the battlefield, soon after in our homes, that's the likely next step. NATO, for example, would almost certainly start using nuclear weapons if its conventional defenses collapse. And to keep the Russians worried, NATO has a doctrine called flexible response, which goes much further. There is no such thing as a pre-planned escalation which necessarily must follow in steps each other, so to speak, first a conventional war and then a nuclear war. This would be very much against our philosophy of flexible response. Flexible response means that the enemy faces a completely uncalculable risk. 
It might even be that we use nuclear weapons from the outset. If the political decision is made for that, the military is prepared.